Hello everyone, we'll start in a few minutes. Hi, Anne. Hi, hello. Hi. Hi. Hello, good morning. Hello. Hi, hello. Hi, 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 hi Chandima. We'll start in, within two minutes. Uh, we are all here. Okay. We'll start. Yeah. Good to see you. Okay, you too. We have five more minutes before we start the program, so we'll sure. uh, just wait. No worries. Yeah. So, and I should finish maybe in forty-five minutes or so. Yes, and then we, are have... we are we are live now, so we'll finish within forty-five minutes, and we'll have fifteen minutes of question and answer sessions. Will that do? Okay. okay. So, and Divya is going to manage the Q. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. I'll do that for you. So, the Divya, question... you know, like you know, in about fifteen twenty minutes, you know when. Uh, so... 
Is there a problem with the audio? I'm maybe oh. muted. Uh, Am I muted? Can you no. hear me? Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. I can. I can. I can. Okay. So I was just telling Anne that I will, you know, I should take about forty to forty-five minutes, and then we'll have the Q and A. So you will. Yeah, sure. Manage, uh, you know, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Yes, you can. Yeah. Ah uh, yeah sure I'll do that I'll do that uh, we I think we almost have now just uh, we just have twenty uh, people uh, watching it live so maybe we can wait for three four minutes for more people to join in and then we can start sure. Ma'am, it's uh, sharp nine. Uh, what do you think? Uh, should we start? And yes, we can. Yeah, we have uh, thirty-six. You know, uh, people watching it live, and I think we've got uh, close to thirty-two participants here too. So, uh, shall we start right on time? I think others can just join in. Yes, we can. Uh, shall I, Dr. Chandrima? I mean, uh, shall I just start? Sure, up to you. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm fine either way. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, welcome to the webinar on culture studies, and uh, uh, we at the Department of English, Bishop Moore College, are. Uh, Extremely honored to have with us uh, Dr. Chandrima Chakravarti, who is a professor of English and Culture Studies, Director, Center for Peace Studies, McMaster University, Canada. Uh, Dr. Chandrima will be talking to us about uh, Culture Studies. Uh, she'll be providing us with an introduction. And uh, we are more glad because uh, her essay is actually prescribed for study at the University of Kerala. And uh, we're extremely happy that we could get you on board, ma'am, for today's lecture. I invite uh, our head of the department, uh, Dr. Anne Angel Nebraham, for the introductory remarks. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Divya. Okay. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Oh, Please okay, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Divya. Thank you for moderating the session. And uh, let me take this opportunity to welcome you all. I won't take much time. Uh, I would welcome you all and I would want to uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Chakrabarti to you, though I know that she needs no introduction. Uh, so let me do this uh, for uh, all, all formality sakes. Well, uh, Welcome to this webinar on cultural studies and visual culture and introduction. Uh, this is hosted by the Department of English, Bishopu College, Mahavalikera, with uh, technical help from the IQAC of the college. 
Um, uh, a moment, please. I'll, uh, I would like to just, uh, I think I've pinned my um, Divya onto the screen. So just let me change that for a moment. Yes. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, as I was saying, Bishamu College, Mavelikira, uh, is one of the top 100 colleges, according to the recent NRIF ranking. We are ranked 76th in the nation. And uh, the Department of English has crossed uh, its uh, 50 years and more. We had the opportunity to host an international conference on Marxism, and we have had the opportunity, our students, and we have got the opportunity to interact with um, many people from across the globe. Uh, we had the likes of uh, Dr. Akhil Bilgrami, we had Professor Simon During, we had Laura Malvi, Professor Laura Malvi with us, and now we have the very eminent young scholar, uh, Dr. Chandrima Chakrabarti with us today. So from what I know, she has been asked by many people to join in, and we are the lucky ones today. And so it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, let me go to the formal part of my um, uh, uh, duty, I would say. Uh, well, um, on behalf of the principal, Dr. Jacob Chandi, and the Internal Quality Assurance Cell Coordinator, Dr. Ranjit Matthew Abraham, the technical team of the IQAC, and the Department of English, Bishop Moore College, the students of Bishop Moore College, the alumni, and all the stakeholders of Bishop Moore College. I would like to welcome you all to this wonderful day. It's our first webinar, and uh, so kindly excuse all uh, that uh, the uh, difficulties that you face. Actually, this started off as a very small uh, idea of mine where I wanted uh, all of us, we wanted our students to hear from the best. You know, they are, as Divya just pointed out, uh, we're studying the essay. So we started out like that, but now we, as we have we are overwhelmed by the registration. We have 663 registered participants from all over India and two from abroad. And we have also uh, uh, on YouTube live, I, I don't think I can take the count of how many are here. That shows for the popularity and the warmth that Dr. Chandrima has in the Indian academic scenario. Uh, on that note, it is a joy to interact with you all. I welcome you all, all the students, the scholars, the teachers, alumni, uh, family, friends, and like-minded people to this seminar. Without further ado, let me introduce the chief guest of the day, Dr. Chandrima Chakraborty. Uh, she, as you all know, is the professor of English and Cultural Studies, director for Center of Peace Studies at the McMaster University in Canada. But a few of you might not know that she was elected to the Royal Society of Canada, College of New Scholars, Artists and Scientists, which is Canada's national system of multidisciplinary recognition for the emerging generation of Canadian intellectual leadership. Her areas of interest include South Asian literatures and cultures, post-colonial cultural studies, religion, nationalism, and Bollywood cinema. She has published several essays on post-colonial theory, religion, nationalism, globalization, Hindu asceticism, and Bollywood cinema, to mention just a few areas of her scholarship. Her articles have appeared in Ariel, Journal of Post-Colonial Writing, Economic and Political Weekly, Journal of Commonwealth and Post-Colonial Studies, just to name a few. Her books include Masculinity, Aestheticism, Hinduism, Past and Present Imaginings of India, Edited volume of Mapping South Asian Masculinities, Men and Political Crisis, published by Routledge, and an edited volume on Remembering Air India, the Art of Public Mourning, for which she's well known in Canada and her research. And she's very passionate about this particular topic. And we have read reviews about that. I'm sure you all know about it. She's currently working on the book Unfinished Past, which examines the socio cultural effects of post 9 11 violence against South Asians. So, this and many more, uh, but the paucity of uh, time uh, stops me here. Uh, we would know more about her um, from her lecture. And uh, this was just planned as an introductory lecture, but I'm sure she would be ready with in, to answer any questions at the end. This is a, a 45 minutes of lecture and 20, 15 minutes of question and answer sessions. So I I'm very honored, let me say this uh, very sincerely, that I'm very honored to have Dr. Chandrima Chakrabarti with us today. 
And as I said earlier, many colleges have been asking her from across India, and we are the lucky ones. So it's a privilege to have you here, ma'am. And on behalf of all gathered here, and uh, on behalf of all the participants watching on YouTube Live, I welcome you and over to you, Dr. Sandhuma Chakrabarti. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, lovely welcome and uh, the introduction. I am uh, deeply honored for this invitation, and I hope that the lecture in some way might help the MA students. I know that they are preparing for their exams. And I'm also you know, so glad to hear that something that I wrote a long time ago is part of the syllabi of Kerala University. So that is a happy feeling. Uh, so just a, a quick note in terms of the lecture. So I have a PowerPoint, so you will mostly see the PowerPoint and I will speak to the PowerPoint that you will see. And then after the lecture, I'll happily take uh, questions. Uh, this is pitched at the uh, introductory level. So if you have advanced knowledge of cultural studies, this might not add too much to your knowledge. So just a disclaimer. So it is at the level, you know, at, a, at an introductory level. So it will be an introduction to cultural studies uh, and uh, visual culture and then Bollywood in particular. And then I have been asked to speak uh, to the essay that is prescribed in the Kerala University syllabus. So towards the end of the lecture, I will talk a bit about that particular essay essay and happy to question, take questions that you might have after. So, so is it okay if I just share my screen and so I'm going to just try to share my screen and show you the PowerPoint. Are you able to see the screen, Anne? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yeah. we can. Perfect. We can. Yes. 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 Perfect. Yes. So perfect. So uh, the title of my uh, talk today is Cultural Studies and, and Visual Culture and Introduction. And this is the outline of the lecture for today. So I will uh, talk about sort of traditional definitions of culture and what culture uh, specifically means in the field of cultural studies. I will then talk about the discipline of cultural studies as it uh, uh, originated in Britain, developed in United States and sort of the Indian context. Then I will talk about visual culture and Bollywood in particular. So that's going to be sort of the line of argument for this talk. Okay. So, so what is culture? Uh, in traditional uh, definitions, culture is always tied to notions of value. So the two sort of definitions of culture, uh, commonsensically, traditionally, historically, is a process of personal refinement. In other words, it means that one has to be trained. So if you want to become a, a reader of the classics, a reader of, of literature, you have to be trained to read. Uh, if you want to become an artist, your eye has to be trained. So in order to emerge as civilized, culti cultivated, as a cultured individual, there is a process of personal refinement that is involved. The other definition of culture that ties it to marks of development or progress is the second definition that you have there, a state of manners, taste, and intellectual development at a time or place. So if you think of uh, British India as an example, so when the British came to India, uh, their uh, understanding or their representation of India was that it was inferior. It was lagging behind in progress and civility and the British took it upon themselves uh, to cultivate culture say, through the teaching of English literature. Think of you know, Milton, Wordsworth, Shakespeare, and along with it, a devaluing of vernacular uh, literature and languages. So when we, were we are talking of uh, culture traditionally, we are talking of high culture, meaning those items that achieve greatest critical acclaim. In other words, uh, the, those elites or those who are scholars, thinkers, philosophers, uh, you know, have vetted cultural items and have deemed them worthy of attention. So again, examples would be, you know, Shakespeare or, you know, Van Gogh's painting or classical dance forms like uh, Kathakali. 
Two main uh, proponents of this high culture are Matthew Arnold and F.R. Lewis. So for Matthew Arnold, uh, his definition of culture is the best uh, which has been thought and say, said in the world. For F.R. Lewis in his book, The Great Tradition, uh, which was published in 1948, he looks at the masterpieces or great works, canonical literature. So the understanding of a high culture is then tied to the concept of universality, meaning the context of creation or the context of circulation of cultural items are not given much importance. The understanding is if something is great or it has been deemed great, for example, Shakespeare for English literature students, that greatness should cross cultural boundaries, doesn't matter which nation you belong to, doesn't matter what your class status might be, doesn't matter what your gender identity might be, you can be taught to appreciate uh, Shakespeare. So again, if you think of British colonialism, uh, these canons of British literature were taught throughout the colonies. So whether you came from India, or you came from Jamaica in the Caribbean, or you came from Nigeria in Africa, these same texts were taught. So again, this, this notion that uh, high culture is of universal value. But what happens when we think of culture in the context of cultural studies? Two seminal thinkers uh, in cultural studies, you probably know them, Raymond Williams, Stuart Hall, and this is their definitions of culture. So for Raymond Williams, culture is ordinary, the everyday. For Stuart Hall, culture is experience lived, experience interpreted, experience defined. In other words, culture does not merely exist in the past, uh, but it is also what is emerging, what is also being created. So both uh, historical elements, but as well as contemporary culture. And their definition of culture also is that it is tied to questions of identity, to power, and it creates or produces particular kinds of effects in us, you know, pleasure. So the joy of reading, not just, you know, what we can, uh, you know, educate our students or what we can cultivate, but also the joys that come out of re reading or, or painting or whatever, you know, cultural act we might be involved in. So for cultural studies, uh, it is not just high culture, it is all, or sort of you know, things that have been deemed important in the past, but it is a study of culture and particularly contemporary culture. So again, culture in the everyday. So we, we see a shift here away from classical or elite cultural forms to popular and often industrially produced forms, such as say cinema, television, radio, popular magazines, things that would not have been deemed worthy of studying according to say Matthew Arnold. So cultural studies is, is interested in the meaning and practices of everyday life. How do everyday people live their lives? So it would study things like shopping or fashion or you know, who eats out, where and how, cartoons, you know, film viewing. So we see then here, there is a, you know, with cultural studies, there is a shift from the emphasis on the written, the textual, to the visual, to social institutions, and to space. But what makes cultural studies really stand out is its focus on power. So its interest in how power and authority are exercised in and through cultural practices. So when we are looking at cultural texts, we are interested in questions of gender. Uh, we are interested in questions of race, class, sexuality. Does anybody know what this image is or where it is from, which film? I'm going to assume that I, or imagine that I see nods there and you know that this is Black Panther. So why Black Panther? You know, why, what, what makes Black Panther important? We have, you know, number of Marvel, Marvel films and this is one more su superhero that has been added to Marvel. But what is important about this superhero movie is that unlike Captain America or, or Iron Man or Spider-Man, what we see now is a black superhero. And again, why does that matter? So yes, we have so many superheroes. Here's one more added to the list. What difference does it make? Huge, because representation matters and black lives matter. This movie is about what it means to be black in both America and Africa and more broadly in the world. 
And the film you know, grapples head on with uh, issues of race, of identity, of violence and trauma affecting modern day you know, black life. And particularly right now in terms of Black Lives Matter, we see the importance of representation. And this is a tweet, uh, which I thought would be interesting to bring to your attention, where this author says, we need diverse representation, not only so every kid can see themselves as the hero of the story, but so that every kid can understand that other kinds of kids are also the heroes of the story. So not just seeing yourself represented in the story and seeing yourself as the hero, but also realizing that there are other kinds of heroes, there are other possibilities. So the empathy or, or the solidarity that uh, stories like Black Panther uh, can bring. So now to talk about the discipline. So how did the when did the discipline uh, you know, sort of you know, begin the, this field of cultural studies? Uh, so again, British cultural studies. So that's where the field begins in the 1950s. Key figures associated with British cultural studies are, again, we should know the names, Richard Hoggart, you know, Raymond Williams, uh, Stuart Hall. And it begins at the Birmingham Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies at the University of Birmingham in 1964. And anybody who is doing you know, or studying anything to do with cultural studies have definitely read a chapter from Stuart Hall's book, Representation and the Media. In the US, cultural studies begins a little bit later. It's only in the 1980s. One of the seminal figures associated with US cultural studies is Edward W. Scythe and his book, 1978 book, uh, Orientalism. And this book, for those in English uh, literature know, has played a seminal role in the field of literary studies with what Scythe called colonial discourse analysis. So he talked about how colonization happens. And of course, yes, as we all know, colonization needs army, it needs soldiers, but Said argued, but it also happens through the power of discourse, the ability to represent others as other, as different, as inferior, as subaltern. So the effects of such positioning and the power of this positioning that he talked about in relation to economics, politics, self-perception of the colonized for generations to come. So a key text in terms of you know, literary studies, but it has its effect goes beyond the field of literary studies, you know, anthropology, religion, history, et cetera. Other key names associated with US cultural studies are you know, Lawrence Grosberg, John Fisk, Judith Butler, and there are you know, many others. Moving on to the uh, to India. In India, uh, two developments in the 1980s had a key effect in terms of the development and the teaching of the field of cultural studies. And one of those is the subaltern study school. And this is in the 1980s, as I said, where a group of historians uh, began looking at the history of India under colonial rule. And key, again, key names associated with the subaltern study school are Ranajit Guha, Shahid Amin, uh, Gayatri Sivak. And their emphasis was on studying cultural events and phenomena to understand historical events. So you can see there's a shift happening, you know, rather than, you know, which king had a war with the other king, who, what are the lives of, you know, or numbers of people lost, their emphasis is on cultural events like uprisings, rebellions, and little known historical figures that often remain invisible in, in, in the story. So subaltern studies, just from the naming, you can see the sort of the ideological and political angle that this uh, group of scholars, historian scholars were taking. So subaltern literally means subordinate, a low rank in the army. And the subaltern studies historians studied his, the history of modern uh, India from, uh, or sorry, they argue that the history of modern India has been narrated from the point of view of the colonizer or the Indian elite. So two groups of elite, whether they are the colonizer or whether they are Indians themselves, it is always the elite perspective, that, which was the dominant point of view. And they were interested in the everyday in the everyday ordinary ways in which people such as peasants, industrial workers, tribals and women made history. So again, they, they wanted to write history, not from the dominant point of view, 
which is again the, the colonizer or the Indian elite, but from the point of view of the subaltern. You know, those stories that were not told, those stories that were always marginalized, those stories that are invisible. So in other words, subaltern studies as a field of study began what is known as history from below. And, you know, its effect goes beyond India. It has affected, you know, writing of history in Latin America, in, in Africa, and in other places. There is another sort of you know, parallel development that happened in India in the 1980s, and that is the writing of uh, women's history. You know, I still remember you know, uh, you know, when I was studying in India, you know, one of the books that I read was Latamani's uh, Contentious Traditions, which you have you know, the image on the slide here, where uh, she talks about the debate on sati or you know, widow burning. And she argues in that book that yes, this is, you know, the sati seems to be about freeing women and liberating women, but we never hear the voices of women, what they felt or what they did and why they did, you know, was there coercion? Uh, was this uh, something that they were, you know, brainwashed into? Was it volitional? All we hear is the debate between the colonizers and the Indian elite. So these are two groups of men deciding the fate of women and debating what's good for them, but we never hear the voices of women. And so this is just, you know, one example of the book, but, you know, there are others like the Jashwini Niranjana, you know, Minakshi Mukherjee, Tanika Sarkar, and many, many others who talked about the difficulties of writing a history of women the lack of women in official archives and history. And what does that mean? Uh, the, what they mean is, it's not that, you know, I have a better set of eyes or I'm more alert to the absence of women in official archives of history. So I'm going to go in there and look for women's presence. They said, women didn't exist. You know, they did not exist in the official archives. So you could not actually go back to the archives and rewrite the history. And, uh, you know, people like, you know, or scholars like Mina, Mukherjee talked about the absence of, you know, women writers in what students were being taught. Uh, so it was mostly male authors that are being taught, not just in sort of the British, you know, Western uh, curriculum, but also in the Indian curriculum. If you think of, um, as an example, you know, partition studies as a field which also develops, you know, towards the you know, latter half of the 1980s, some of the names that, you know, many of you, I'm sure, would be familiar with are Urvashi Butalia, um, Ritu Menon, uh, Kamala Bhashin, uh, Vina Das, right? Anthropologists, historians, um, literary scholars, who again, realizing the lack or the absence of women in official archives in, of history and wanting to write about, uh, write a history of the partition, what do they do? They start showing up in people's houses. So they go to the attics, they look for diaries, they look for write, uh, uh, letters, you know, personal letters, and they try to find out how women lived through this moment of intense violence. How do they make sense of this story? How did they live at the moment of violence and post partition? How, you know, again, how did they make sense of it? How do they remember the partition? So they were interested in studying everyday practices, everyday practices of rumors. How did rumors spread? And you know, Vinadas is you know amazing book on that. Or you know, memorialization practices. You know, Varshi Butalia talking about the memorialization practices that are practiced in your know, Sikh gurudwaras, etc. So again, you know, writing or making women's voices heard and their presence felt, and talking about their contributions to history, literature, and various other fields. So that brings us, you know, from this, you know this uh, uh, sort of my um, comments on sort of historians and literary scholars contributing to this development of cultural studies in India and beyond tells us that cultural studies is an interdisciplinary field. So interdisciplinary meaning it draws from a range of disciplines and uh, in humanities and social sciences. So you can sort of, you know, see in the slide, you know, some of the critical approaches that cultural studies scholars use uh, to read read or analyze, you know, uh, cultural texts, you know, Marxism, semiotics, feminist theory, uh, ethnography, critical race theory, post-colonialism, post-structuralism, you know, and, and many more that you can see on, on this um, slide. So that brings us to, uh, you know, Bollywood or cultural studies. So does Bollywood qualify as, you know, as 
a field that should be of interest to cultural studies scholars? And I would say an emphatic yes, because if you think back on the conversation that we just had, like, you know, what defines cultural studies? One, a study of culture. So when we are thinking of, you know, Bollywood, we are thinking of culture and particularly contemporary culture. So a check mark there. Next, cultural studies as interested in the meaning and practices of everyday life. So when we are looking at Bollywood, we are watching Bollywood films, we see a representation of the current society, whether it's sort of, you know, gender identities, whether it's patriarchy, whether it's masculinity, friendship, et cetera, you know, fashion, jewelry, all of those things. So the meaning and practices of everyday life. And finally, as I said, you know, something that really, you know, do, uh, is at the core of the field of cultural studies, the emphasis on power. How is power exercised in and through cultural practices? And again, sort of, you know, Bollywood fits the bill. So I'll talk, you know, just, you know, briefly about visual culture, you know, and, and then again, talk about Bollywood as visual culture. So, uh, as we all know that even before we had uh, texts, we had photo, uh, we had uh, you know paintings and, and and drawings, you know, right from the time that you know we, we lived in caves. So we always had so pictures always preceded texts. Yet the term visual culture you know, comes into existence much later. And you know, sort of what is known as a, the visual turn in cultural studies points to the historical shift that we see in the importance that is given to vision, to images and technologies of production of images and the subjectivities that are created through these images. So the origins of uh, visual culture is traced to the 1950s in England, but it really took off, the field really took off in the 1990s. Again, some seminal figures associated with this field are Nicholas Sinomirziov, John Story, Arjun Akkadurai. So Mirzov, in the subject of visual culture, which is again a seminal text for uh, visual culture studies, argues that subjects are an agent of sight and they're also the effect of visual subjectivity. So what does that mean? So they are an agent of sight, meaning that we are you know, seeing, we are seeing be beings, uh, we, uh, we view products, items, artifacts, so we are agent of sight, we have agency in what we are seeing, right, in terms of our vision, what, where our gaze goes and where it doesn't, but we are also created as subjects through these acts of seeing, right, so which kinds of movies we watch, what kinds of clothes we decide to buy, right, that affects how we create ourselves as subjects. And, you know, in terms of, you know, in our contemporary times, you know, the hyper intensification of visual technologies that we see, the everyday assault of social media, phones now that now serve as cameras, films that can be released via YouTube. And for those of you who might remember grainy Duradarshan or the nine o'clock news, you know, versus the 24 hour news cycle that we have, it will take, you know, no convincing that images have become inseparable from our daily reality. And this then also brings up uh, questions of accessibility, privilege, privacy, and surveillance. Uh, think of COVID-19 or the coronavirus, you know, pandemic right now. Like many of you um, here too in Canada, we have moved to you know online uh, learning, which means like many of you, I'm also you know trying to learn and navigate all kinds of online you know platforms in Zoom, Google Meets, Microsoft Teams. Yet that also throws up questions of who has a phone, you know who has a computer, what is the quality of connectivity. What if you are sharing a room with your sibling and you both have a Zoom uh, session at the same time? Who gets access? If you have one computer in the house and your mom is working from home and your you know, brother or sister are also doing online school, who will have access to that one computer in the house? So issues of class, issues of race, gender, housing, employment, and the vulnerability of you know, certain populations have become just more visible uh, with, the, with the pandemic. And so these are questions that you know, uh, studies, uh, scholars who are studying visual culture would be interested in. So if we think of Bollywood as visual culture, as many of you know, I know Bollywood was not considered 
worth studying. It was not seen as a serious subject. It was, you know, dancing around the trees and, you know, women getting you know, soaked in rain, right? So it was not, it did not become a field of academic study until the 1990s. And because Bollywood was constantly, you know, uh, contrasted with art cinema or parallel cinema, which were seen as serious cinema that dealt with social issues, the day-to-day -day problems of people, you know, people's lives versus, you know, popular commercial mainstream. And often popular commercial mainstream is seen as trashy if you go back to, you know, Matthew Arnold and Effer uh, Lewis. What you also see with Bollywood, you know, uh, uh, to qualify as visual culture is a shift, of course, from the written to the visual, right? So we are interested in questions of, you know, seeing, practices of seeing and mediation. How are the stories being told? How are, are they mediating for us? And I'll talk about it more when I talk about Lagan. And again, as I said, you know, the question of power. So how is power exercised in the creation and in the circulation of films. So if you think of you know, plot uh, or storylines, uh, the selection of, of the film cast, is it going to be Anatav Bachchan or is it Shah Rukh Khan or a lesser known actor? And depending on the choice of this cast, it tells us how much this film might circulate, how well it might be received, how well it might do in the box office. And when we're talking of Bollywood cinema, we're also talking of how um, certain cultural practices are being validated and contested, taught, consolidated by the film. So for example, like if we were in a classroom right now, I would ask you, you know, can you, you know, identify the other, uh, you know, uh, film star that you see in this particular, you know, slide. And I can tell you that unless you are from Kerala or have some connection to Kerala, chances are that you won't recognize Fahad Fasil or might have vaguely heard of a film called Kumbalangi uh, Nights. And so Bollywood, which was until the 1990s, uh, of, uh, a film or a cinema or an industry that was not considered worthy of, stu of uh, studying has also been able to now successfully push regional uh, cinemas uh, as you know sort of peripheral cinema or to the sidelines and um, for those of you who have not watched you know Kumbalangi Nights I, I would uh, you know strongly strongly recommend that you you know watch it it's an excellent film about you know three brothers and they're both their specific very distinctive struggles but also their collective struggles you know it brings up questions of you know patriarchy uh, domestic violence uh, questions around you know morality and sexuality youth unemployment housing mental health and uh, Fahad Fasil is just amazing and i'm sure you will be you know entertained by his performance as much as i was um, so now moving on to sort of methodologies methodologies uh, that we would use to study Bollywood. And do remember that, you know, sort of the methodologies that we would use to study Bollywood also, would also apply to other kinds of cinema, whether it's, you know, Malayalam cinema, Tamil cinema, Bhojpuri cinema, or Bengali cinema. So how would we, what are the methodologies that we might use to study, you know, cinema, in this case, Bollywood? So of course, we would, you know, uh, look at the content and the, and the language. So, you know, close reading, uh, critical reading. In other words, we are drawing upon some of the methodologies that, you know, uh, we have brought to bear on literature. So some of those tools, right, close reading, critical reading, semiotics, you know, discourse and analysis, going back to Said. We would also look at, uh, secondly, the context. So what are the various political, economic, or social forces uh, that shape and are shaped by film. So what is the con context of this film's creation? What kinds of, you know, issues are they responding to? So, uh, so if you think of, you know, this particular, you know, image you have uh, here of, you know, Android uh, Kunyapan, which tells the story of a lonely old man and a robot. And for many of us, you know, who are in the diaspora and have, you know, elderly parents or extended family members back home, it really touches a chord. And, and specifically so for Kerala society, where you have in every home, there is a daughter or a son or a cousin who is outside India. And the effects of this, um, uh, you know, uh, on everyday life in Kerala in terms of consumerism, the cost of, you know, everyday items, uh, tourism, 
uh, mental health of elderly population, domestic violence, and so forth. So those are sort of you know, questions that cultural studies scholars looking at a film uh, like this would uh, analyze. And you could you know, draw upon an archival research, you could do interviews, with you know senior populations in Kerala, for instance, so you would draw upon you know ethnographic uh, uh, modes of inquiry. The third thing that we would study, if we are analyzing you know uh, or a methodology that we would use to study Bollywood, is of course how films get uh, distributed, right? So not just the creation of the film, but also how this film sells, how it's packaged, how it's marketed, and how it is uh, distributed. Uh, so again, you know, uh, what kinds of billboards, what kinds of posters, you know, music, is it a trailer, is it an item number that is used to promote a film, is it a particular well-known star like, you know, uh, you know, say Mohanlal in the context of, you know, Kerala or Amitabh Bachchan or Shah Rukh Khan or whoever in the context or Kajol in the context of, you know, Bollywood would be used to, or would filmmakers, you know, use to, you know, to pr produce and how is it marketed, is it marketed as an Indian film, is it marketed as a, as as a buddy film, is it marketed as an action film? Like again, how does it gather audiences uh, to show up? Uh, now looking at uh, Lagan uh, specifically, so this is a 2001 film, and I know most of you know about this film well based on you know, what's prescribed uh, for your reading. So if we apply all of the things that we talked about in terms of you know, cultural studies and visual culture to analyze this particular film, so we would of course do discourse analysis. So analyzing the dialogue, you know, the maison scene, the characters in the film, you know, the plot construction, the structuring of the story, you know, the song lyrics, Questions of power that this film would bring up for us would include, you know, questions of nationalism, questions of gender, class, religion, you know, who occupies space, who has access to which space, how is space shared or not shared in the film, questions of marketing, why did this film do so well? Again, how it brought together two of India's you know, great passions, cricket and anti-colonial resistance, you know, as a way of you know, selling tickets. Feelings, what kinds of feelings? does this film elicit in us? You know, what kinds of pleasures do we get by watching, you know, Amir Khan with his unbuttoned shirt? Or what kinds of discomfort uh, does the film arouse for us uh, when we look at sort of, you know, gender uh, stereotypes or sort of, you know, stereotypes of the Dalit? What kinds of dissenting visions does it, you know, offer um, for us? So here you have, you know, two, uh, uh, two posters of Lagan. So if you were to look at sort of the poster on the left, for instance, and even if you did not know what the story of Lagan is, just from the poster, a particular message is being given. So look at the poster on your left. Uh, so uh, it says, we can see uh, Amir Khan foregrounded. So we know that he's the hero of the film. You know, it draws our eye to Amir Khan. And then we see behind him, a group of man, men standing shoulder to shoulder. So again, just from that image, we can assume that this film has got something to do with masculinity. It has got something to do with male friendship. It has got something to do with male bonding because we can see all of these men, and you know, one is a Sikh, one you know, uh, you know, stands out as you know, uh, as different, but they are all standing shoulder to shoulder uh, together. If you look at the other uh, poster here, you see Amir Khan again, you know, foregrounded you know, with his, you know, bare chest, uh, unbuttoned button shirt, and behind him are two women who are not standing side by side, as you see in the first, you know, poster here, but their backs are against each other. And immediately, uh, you know, for Bollywood uh, viewers, we are told that this is perhaps a film about a love interest. Here are two women you know, one white, one Indian, who are vying for the attention of this male, male hero. So if I am somebody who loves romance, I would perhaps want to see this film. Whereas if, you know, I'm, I'm somebody who likes, you know, buddy films or action films, the other poster suggests perhaps there is something there for me. Now look at sort of, uh, you know, both, uh, something that appears on both posters, Lagan, Once Upon a Time in India, and the other one too, Lagan, Once Upon a Time in India. Now, what does once upon a time in India elicit in our heads? Think of all of the stories that you've heard from your grandmothers, grandfathers, and uncles and aunts, 
all great stories, believe me, begins with once upon a time. So as soon as we see once upon a time on that poster or these two posters, it brings up childhood memories, nostalgia. It immediately creates the desire to know, watch the film, you know, buy a ticket and perhaps some popcorn and be beverage as well. So the poster by saying once upon a time and then in India, the film that had divided people by genres, you know, I want an, I like action films or I like romance, now brings those two groups of viewers together by saying, this is a story about India. So if you are Indian or you belong to India, or if you have India in your heart, this is a story. It's a legendary tale that you would want uh, to uh, listen to. So the differentiated audience based on, you know, you know gender or, or, or class, et cetera, are brought together to, through this sort of once upon a time in India, the story of India that every Indian should know about. So I'm going to now sort of move on to the, uh, uh, our sort of you know, reference some of uh, the conversation that comes up in the essay that you are reading, Bollywood Motives, Cricket Fiction and Fictional Cricket. So I'm just, you know, I've put it here for those who might be, you know, watching this presentation and who are not part of Kerala University. And I will quickly give you a, 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 a rundown of the plot in case you haven't watched the film or you watched it a long time ago and need a quick uh, refresher. So Lagan is set uh, in a village in central India. The East India Company looks after the defense of the state in lieu of taxes or Lagan paid by the peasants. And the year in which the film is set, we are told that there has been no rainfall. And we are also reminded that there has been no rainfall uh, in the year previous to it. Yet the peasants have to pay taxes. So they decide that they would meet with their local king and they would request a tax waiver from him. When they show up to talk to the king, the king at that point is watching a friendly game of cricket uh, bit, uh, that is being played by officials of the East India Company. And the peasants are asked to wait until the match is over. So even though the farmer's uh, very existence is in question, their life is under threat, the game of cricket takes precedence. The game of cricket cannot be interrupted. So with this you know, simple uh, cinematic gesture of having to wait, having made to wait, the hierarchy of power structures are immediately established, both for the film's characters, the peasants who show up, and for us watching the film. So the villagers wait, and the villagers watch the British players. And Bhuvan, who is the protagonist of the film, played by Amir Khan, uh, explains to his fellow villagers, oh, you know, this is a game that we play in the village. It's, it's Gili Danda, which all the village children play. So they make sense of this unfamiliar foreign sport through something that is familiar or legible to them. So that goes back to, you know, Stuart Hall's, you know, definition of culture, culture as lived, culture as experienced, culture as interpreted. So through the knowledge basis available to the villagers, they interpret this unfamiliar game. And, and furthermore, they laugh. And why do they laugh? Because they're amused to see that adult men can run around and play. You know, these are villagers. They don't have the privilege to play games. So they talk and they laugh and they joke, you know, why are adult men, you know, behaving immaturely? You know, why are they playing? So, you know, as sort of, you know, this article Bollywood Motives discusses in, in detail, you know, something uh, like cricket, which was used as a civilizing, educating tool, just like, you know, English literature, uh, that was supposed to turn effeminate Indian men into real cultured men or well-mannered men is re-employed to render the colonizer as an object of uh, amusement. So Stuart Hall argues that culture is always a site of negotiation where intended meanings could be short uh, circuited. So for Lagan or in Lagan, we see a detailed uh, illustration of the various processes by which, you know, specific and complex negotiations take place, you know, and 
complex negotiations uh, that are you know sort of led by Amir Khan, the hero of the film, uh, who is involved in creating together a subaltern cricket team because you know they have to play a cricket game against the uh, colonizer and sort of the bet that or sort of the challenge that is posed before then is that if you can beat the British in their own game, you don't have to pay taxes, right? So here is Amir Khan, and you can see all of the characters here who are trying to bring together the, uh, these villagers uh, who, uh, you know, who have never played cricket but know Gilidanda, and he's trying to bring them together, this motley group of people, to create a subaltern cricket team. And even as he does so, we are constantly reminded or alerted to the indigenous social structures that the subaltern inhabits. You know, so with sort of gender hierarchies, class hierarchies, religious hierarchies, and you know, hierarchies of ability, so abled and disabled bodies, caste, and so forth. So what we see in the film is a strategic alliance, a strategic alliance of individuals who are socially quite different, even though they inhabit the same space of the village. And they come together in the strategic alliance to resist the current oppression of the white man. So in other words, it's not a structural change that we are seeing in the film, but a coming together to fight the oppression of the moment. And this allows the film uh, you know, uh, to render very well in terms of nationalist reading. And one of the reasons the film has done so well. So again, it brings cricket and Bollywood to national spectacles uh, together. It desecrates you know, the British subject's originality as the creator of cricket or sort of you know, questions the purity of cricket's rules. So here you have a vision of India as a superpower that is bringing the West to, the, to, to, uh, to its needs. It's bringing, bringing Captain Russell and his team uh, to its knees who, you know, who now lose a game uh, that is played by villagers who don't have you know, proper equipment, proper attire. You know, again, look at in this image, you, know, you have you know, white um, clothed uh, British uh, players versus you know, Amir Khan and you know, the rest of the other players who don't have you know, all of those gear or attire and it's all you know, uh, uh, homemade and sort of you know, the indigenization of cricket that happens. So we see here uh, a, the, a defeat that is made possible of the colonial or Western oppressor, in this specific case, um, the British. And it also helps this particular film uh, to recuperate Indian or native masculinity, not just by defeating the British in supposedly in their own game, but also by Amir Khan being the love interest of a white female subject. So the native is now desired and is desirable by a white female subject. And yet he chooses the native girl. So a slap on the face of you know, the West or, or Britain in this case in more ways than one. However, if, uh, you know, sorry, not however, uh, going back uh, to sort of, you know, Stuart Hall and his question of, you know, how films or any kinds of cultural, you know, items are received or sort of, you know, reception. So if you walk into a shop or a hotel, how you are received. So the question of reception and how you, you know, decode the messages of where you are made to sit, how long you're made to stand. Similar thing happening with, you know, cultural studies object where Stuart Hall was fascinated by how we, meaning viewers, uh, decode the different messages that culture is telling us. So do we have to buy the nationalist reading of this film? Could we read it differently? So one example would be gender. So if you were to use the methodology of feminist analysis to look at the film, you would argue that you know, cricket is rendered as a quintessentially masculine sport, right? And not just cricket but so is colonialism, a quintessentially masculine, masculine sport, and so is anti-colonial resistance. So again, you know, one poster from Lagan where you see Captain Russell and, you know, Amir Khan, you know, uh, together. So again, a a and, and, you know, a number of scholars have said that, right? Colonialism uh, was a, a, a negotiation, a contest between elite Indian men and, and colonizers. And similarly, anti-colonial resistance has always led by the dominant uh, elite and the masses followed, right? So uh, uh, in, in, in terms of the film, 
as I said, if you're using sort of, you know, a gendered, you know, lens to look at it, you would say, well, look at the women in the film. It's all stereotypical portrayal of women who are constantly cast in relation to the male protagonist. They are somebody's mother. They are someone's wife. They are somebody's lover. They are somebody's sister, right? They don't stand uh, on their own. They're always in companionate, uh, sorry, companionate and, and supportive roles. They are bringing food. They sing songs. They pray for the success of their you know, male sons and, and, and love interests and cousins and neighbors. So the sort of the image or sort of the binary that we, again, a stereotypical you know, um, um, motif that is employed, not just in Bollywood cinema, but you know, uh, Hollywood as well, is sort of this whole virgin binary. Right? Either we have sexualized exotic female characters, you know, Gauri and Elizabeth, you know, the, the two uh, uh, women that you see on the slide, or they are victims of oppression, you know, women's, uh, sorry, Bhuvan's mother and the wives of all the uh, villagers. You can, however, uh, sorry, I'll just go back to the slide. However, you can also say, well, yes, there is gender oppression and, you know, there is a difference between uh, Indian women and white women. But in the context of colonial cricket, we can see that how women are marginalized across this racial divide, right? So in the film, Elizabeth's appropriation of the masculine role of the cricket coach and teaching the villagers the intricacies of colonial cricket disrupts, disrupts the masculine preserve of the game. At the same time, it portrays her as a white savior. So in other words, brown men need guidance from white women to be successful in the sport and also to be successful in mounting an anti-colonial resistance. If you're looking you know, from the point of view of, of the portrayal of you know, disabled, untouchable Kachra, just look at the naming. Just by this literal naming as trash or garbage, he's rendered outside. Right? He's trashed, he's garbage. And he is allowed in temporarily, he can join the cricket team, not because caste structures have been demolished or will be demolished in the future, right? But he's allowed in temporarily to join the game because he is exceptional as a spinner, so, right? So his inclusion in the, team, uh, in the cricket team is contingent on performance. So you could make an argument that you know, the film just consolidates the caste structures. If there is no structural systemic change uh, that is envisioned in this film and therefore you know, a problematic film in, in ways. Yet this film by drawing or sort of, you know, bringing together cricket fiction and fictional cricket as sort of the essay argues through dreamed up past, it contests and writes over the given narratives of modernity and history and it charts a field of contest. So depending on the viewer and the lens that we are bringing uh, to look at the film, we can question or contest the film's portrayal of, of women or, or, or untouchable uh, or sort of, you know, the cricket team or the Sikh subject, etc. If you look at the cinematic ending, and this is a quote uh, from the article that you're reading, we have a male narrator who comes in at the end of the film and says the film's project has been to recover, and I've sort of highlighted some key words here. The film's project has been uh, to recover an experience that's lost, to re uh, recover an experience that we were unaware of. So, right, so you know, use cricket history or indigenizing cricket. In the Indian context, it tells us of a specific and distinctive historical practice. So again, trying to make visible distinct stories that are lost because they come from the point of view of the subaltern. And finally, that the film resists colonial misrepresentations of native societies by foregrounding native agency. So Bhuvan and the others do not need an elite to, or a foreigner to come and teach them about the oppressions or the discriminations uh, uh, that are sort of the disenfranchisements that they um, endure every day and they can come together to fight, you know, the British colonizer as needed or the feudal lord when needed, right? It also questions the authenticity and universality of official versions of Indian national history, the erasures and silences in it, and it raises doubts in the minds of the spectators. So what kinds of doubts that, you know, perhaps, you know, cricket has a different history, perhaps Indian history 
has been written from the point of view of particular groups and we need to rewrite and rethink history. What's also interesting in terms of you know, uh, this particular film and the cinematic ending is it's narrated by no other than Amitav Bachchan, you know, that's the voiceover, who is the quintessential Bollywood star. And his narration of this story uh, as a story about recovering the experience of the subaltern gives it authority and credibility. So it makes the uh, story of Lagan appear uh, not as fictional, but as history. So again, opening up alternative possibilities of looking at you know, uh, Indian history. So what does then Lagan you know, accomplish? You know, number of things I would say. So one would be uh, you know, the, the argument that Appadurai, Arjuna Padurai makes that you know, decolonization is not you know, a single dismantling of the colonial past, but it's a continual, continuing uh, dialogue, ongoing dialogue with the colonial past, but also with the legacies in the present. So if you think of Lagan, it was released at a time, you will probably remember, when Western India was witnessing intense drought and the newspaper headlines were filled with stories of farmer suicides. So for viewers who were going in to watch this film at that time, the connection between you know, colonial oppression or Cap Captain Russell in this, you know, in this fictional film and what's happening real life in India gets connected. Right, so they can see the you know so they can see the presence of the past in their present. So, in other words, colonialism does not merely end with the departure of the colonizer. The second thing that this you know film uh, remarkably accomplishes is the representation of Indian past through which it destabilizes official discourses, whether it's about you know, Indian history or, or whether it's sort of you know, colonial uh, writers writing about Indian history. And it opens up space for reinterpretation and a reimagining of Indian history. And it does so by making the masses as historical subjects. And when I say masses, I just don't mean the cinematic characters but also the viewers who are going in uh, to watch this film. So why cultural studies? And this is sort of my you know, concluding side. So why cultural studies? What does this you know, field uh, offer us? So I would say that again, you know, something that I have tried to trace throughout, uh, sorry, stress throughout the presentation, the emphasis on power. Uh, so cultural studies as a field by playing em placing emphasis on power makes it you know, naturally self-reflexive it constantly asks us to question or understand ourself in relation to the world around us, right? So it is constantly ask us, asks us to you know, self-reflect. Uh, it asks us to examine how we are both positioned by culture, but how we also position ourselves in relation to cultural objects in relation to representations and various kinds of cultural process, processes. So not just uh, that we are positioned by culture or that we are shaped by culture, but we also position our ourselves in relation to culture or that we also shape culture. So it asks us to investigate you know, our values, beliefs and belonging, uh, our economic and social relations, institutions, identities, you know, what kinds of Privileges, entitlements do we bring uh, into conversations? Uh, you know, what is absent in the conversation? When do we speak for? When do we speak with? Right, all those kinds of questions. And I would say fundamentally as a field, its emphasis or its project of social change where it constantly offers us visions of alternative futures, asks us to envision alternative futures and better equitable and inclusive futures. So I think you know, that is what you know, makes this field so important. Uh, and uh, to me personally, so that you know, this emphasis on social change, social transformation, and the emphasis on asking us to you know, rethink, reassess, and you know, be, be re reflective about it. So I will stop there and then you know, I'll happily uh, take questions. So thank you, it was, it was a long presentation. Thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chandrima. Uh, indeed, uh, thank you very much, you know, for uh, actually taking us through uh, the entire span of culture studies right from the beginning, right from the beginning, and then, you know, going on to 
uh, visual culture, telling us about what was really happening in the Indian scenario, and finally coming to Bollywood and movies and to the essay that is actually prescribed for study for students here. I'm sure many of the students have uh, immensely benefited from your lecture. Uh, thank you very much, in fact, for uh, shedding light. And uh, But I still have a feeling that uh, the time was too less for you to, in fact, talk in detail about everything because uh, I wish you could actually talk more on visual culture uh, that I think we just had a couple of slides. Yes, yeah, maybe we can do it uh, at a later point, but yeah. I think many of us would really be interested to know more about it. So uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, very engaging and enriching session. Thank you indeed. Uh, we have a couple of questions, I think. Uh, uh, yes, uh, shall I go ahead with the questions? Yes, please. Yeah, uh, there is... Uh, there is a question from Mahesh H. And the question is, uh, uh, could you enumerate upon the emerging areas in research and cultural studies and visual culture? Emerging areas in cultural studies and visual culture. So um, I would say sort of in terms of emerging fields, there is a lot of work that is coming out in terms of disability studies, uh, math studies. So, uh, you know, the emphasis on uh, mental health and in the context of what's happening, particularly in the United States, where uh, the field of cultural studies uh, deals a lot with questions of race and representation. So I would, see in, I would say in terms of you know, emerging conversations and what we will see in the future, I would, see, I, I would guess that there would be a lot of you know, engagement with questions of race and racial representation, you know, violence. Uh, as well as sort of, you know, surveillance fields, right? You know, with 9-11 and the shifts that we have seen in terms of, you know, security and surveillance, uh, terrorism and surveillance studies uh, is, you know, questions of privacy. Those kinds of questions are where sort of the field is going. And, and then finally, I would say, of course, you know, media studies, right? Uh, in terms of, you know, social media. Uh, so there's a lot of work in terms of, you know, you know uh, tweets and Facebook, uh, images, you know, how the roles that they might play in elections or fake news, for example, right? Again, another, uh, you know, area where there is a lot of work, uh, you know, coming out. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a question. Uh, in fact, there are two questions and I'll just combine the two. Uh, there's a question from Joe's Babu who asks, uh, like, what's your opinion on the cricket as a representation of reality versus fiction? Cricket as a representation of reality versus fiction. And there's another question from Rajiv Mato, who's asking, how do you see this film Lagan, which you seem to have researched at great length from the lens of pluralistic culturalism? Okay. So, um, so Joe's Babu's question and the other one. Okay, so cricket as reality versus fiction. So. Uh, in this particular film, you know, Lagan, as, as you know, I mean, you know, scholars, uh, different cricket historians have made, you know, different arguments, uh, sort of, you know, Borya Majumdar and others saying, well, you know, this goes back to, you know, it is actually a vernacular sport and cricket does not belong, belong to England. They do not have, uh, you know, it's not a legitimate argument. And other scholars like Manthia Diwara, again, another famous, uh, you know, uh, um, Cinema, uh, cinema scholar uh, and cricket historian, uh, others arguing that you no, know, no, no, cricket did you know begin uh, in in in, um, uh, in the UK and it was used as a civilizing tool, uh, uh, particularly in the context of you know Caribbean and, and of course you know South Asia. So there is you know what we see in this film is a fictionalization of cricket history, right? It's a fictionalization of cricket history, an indigenization of cricket history, a vernacularization of cricket history as a way to assert, you know, Indian identity, right? That's what we see in the film, you know, Indian, in this case, rural identity, uh, right? In terms of cricket reality, there have also been schol uh, scholarly work who have looked at the role of real life cricketers, right? So the role of caste, uh, in the context of the actual the Indian cricket team, most recently you will you know you probably saw the debate about how black cricketers were referred by Indian cricketers, right? So again, in real life, so sometimes the fictional and the real life does come together, where questions of race, uh, questions of you know gender, you know who does in, in real life, who is you know doing the narrating of the cricket store, uh, of the cricket game, who goes to watch the cricket games, who sits where. 
right? So all of those questions. So sometimes, yes, it is fictional cricket that we are watching in, in Lagan, but there are also moments in the film that where we can see resonances in terms of actual cricket, right? Who plays the game, who has money to buy the, you know, uh, all of the gear, right? Even now in India, like who can play, you know, is it easier to play soccer versus cricket? You know, what is the gear needed? And that then ties into questions of, you know, access, right? And, and class. So yes, it is, uh, you know, a fictional cricket, but yes, we do see, you know, real life uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, real life aspects of those fictionalized versions that we see in the film. Uh, yes, uh, there's uh, another question. Uh, could you please elaborate on the visual culture that is being propagated through advertisements in the light of cultural studies? So, visual, sorry, can you repeat the, repeat the question once more? Uh, could you please elaborate on the visual culture that is being propagated through advertisements in the light of cultural studies? Yeah, absolutely. So what you saw, you know, sort of the cultural, you know, analysis that I provided in terms of the two posters of Lagan that I showed you, the one uh, with, you know, Amir Khan, and then, you know, the group of uh, uh, the cricketers behind him. And then the other poster that I showed you with, again, Amir Khan, you know, sort of a very masculine image with, you know, as I said, you know, unbuttoned shirts and all of that. And then, you know, juxtaposed with two, two women figures behind him. And that is what, you know, billboards and advertisements do, right? So in terms of visual culture and how you would analyze them, you would analyze the placing of the images, right? So in one case, you have all of the men, men standing in line, whereas in the other case, you know, two women back to back. So we know that they're not aligned. They're not, you know, sharing space together. So when you're looking at, you know, billboards, and the fact that you have multiple posters of a film or maybe a product, whether it's a Nike shoe or whatever it might be, it, it is giving you different messages. And the reason why you have different posters of the same product is because it's trying to draw in different kinds of buyers different kinds of viewers, right? Uh, so, you know, sometimes it's ap appealing to maybe, you know, children, sometimes it's appealing to adults, sometimes it's appealing to women. So again, when you're looking at advertisements, you have to look at the placing of the text, what text is there, what is the image like and how they are placed. So you're using all of those, you know, methodologies of, you know, visual cultural analysis, but you are sort of saying, you know, what is the cultural context of the time? Why do we have, say, for instance, you know, all the advertisements that I'm seeing right now about, you know, masks, you know, all kinds of masks being sold. So it wouldn't make sense to anybody, perhaps, you know, 50 years past us or 100 years past us, if you said, you know, masks were being sold, unless you say, well, this is coronavirus, there was a pandemic, we all had to wear masks, and therefore, so again, the social cultural context that results in the production of particular kinds of billboards and particular kinds of advertisements and who show up in that billboard, right? That also is tied to, again, you know, if the company has enough money, who's cast, right? Is it Mohanlal? Is it, you know, Mamuti? Is it Shah Rukh Khan? You know, is it a lesser known actor or, or, a, or a cricketer, right? So again, in terms of, you know, billboards and advertisements, you know, where they're placed, is it placed in the city center? Is it, you know, uh, uh, on, the, on a roadside, how big is the billboard, right? So there are so many different ways that you would use visual cultural uh, tools to analyze them. Uh, Ma'am, we've got a lot of questions coming. I hope uh, you can take a few more. Or okay, sure. uh, Maybe now... two or three more, is that okay? Yeah, two more, just we'll stop with two more. Yeah. Uh, so, uh... There's a question from Reverend Thomas Samuel, and the question is, uh, will the reimagining uh, re of India, that is regional history too, lead to more controversy and confusion? Will the reimagining of Indian history, re regional history, lead to more controversy and more confusion? Depends on how you, you, know, how you define confusion, right? Because uh, history is always written by someone, right? It's a point of view of the person writing the history. History is not, you know, objective in the way we have been taught to think of history in terms of dates and numbers. Even if you think of, you know, dates and numbers, you know, are there names associated with those numbers? Do we know, you know, there are 100 people dead or do we have a list of those 100 names, right? So if you're thinking of, you know, 
what is the function of history? So perhaps the question that you're asking is, what is history? Should history be a monolith, a singular tale of the nation? Meaning, is the nation made up of just one kind of subject? Or is the nation, and it's, you know, it's true to India, but any other nation, a nation is made up of people of different classes, genders, you know, ethnicities, religion. Is it possible that all of these re, you know, religions, classes, castes, can come together within this unitary version of history, right? At moments of crisis, we might, but otherwise, isn't it always a plural history, right? Isn't history always plural, depending on, you know, as I said, in terms of, you know, women's history. So it is only in the 1980s that you had, you know, all of these amazing, you know, women historians, sociologists, others who are trying to retrieve the voices of women and put them in the his history books, right? So chaos and confusion, but perhaps that's the reality, right? Otherwise, we are creating this fictional history. And often this fictional history would be tied to who questions of, you know, going back to cultural studies and the emphasis on power, who has the power and the authority to tell the story. So if it's one history, it's one story, and often it has been his story, not her story. Right or stories. So even with you know um, with uh, as I said with part, you know partition studies, there is a movement away from textual history to thinking of oral history as history. Right. Uh, so yes. So I would say uh, chaos. Yes, but that is the reality that you know we are we straddle multiple histories uh, because uh, it is about lived experience and our lived experiences are not the same depending on whether we live in a city or, or a town, what kinds of education we have, what kinds of you know, genders we are, what kinds of sexualities we might have, what our religion might be. And therefore, if we are talking of our histories, it would be very different, different histories. Yeah, sure. Just this is the last final question, the last question. And the question is uh, from uh, Mr. Premji Jamal from the Department of English, Vishwamo College. And the question is, uh, how does cultural studies account for the contemporary culture, which has been unlike in the immediate past, largely because it's shaped by social media these days? And does the infinite difference in individualistic history, other than a collective history, pose a challenge to cultural studies? So you, you will... Yeah, I think I got the question. So, you know, cultural studies as a field uh, does not have you know, a methodology as I tried to explain, or it is not tied to a discipline, right? So we are drawing on, you know, number of humanities fields. We are drawing on social science fields. We are drawing all kinds of, you know, methodologies. So that itself says that this is an interdisciplinary, a multidisciplinary field, which is drawing upon all of these kinds of knowledge bases uh, to create, uh, you know, a, a perhaps a better or more improved understanding uh, of the social cultural context uh, of the time. Uh, so there is, you know, again, in terms of, you know, uh, social media, as you mentioned, yes, you know, we, we are at a time when, you know, it has become easier uh, perhaps to hear of stories uh, that uh, were not so available previously through the access, you know, to social media. You know, I'm sitting here in Canada and I can give a lecture and I have, you know, access to all of you, right? Uh, so it, it might it not, it would not have been possible with the Zoom or, you know, these kinds of uh, platforms uh, that, that we have. So we are, I think, you know, talking of, you know, and cultural studies as a field is interested in the everyday, is interested in plural versions of the everyday, in, in difference, right? And in all kinds of difference, you know, um, uh, or, or sort of, you know, social hierarchies, you know, how is, you know, power created, how is power exercised. So again, even if you think, you know, of the example that you brought up in terms of social media, it also assumes, you know, somebody has a phone, somebody has internet connection, you know, somebody has time, the ability to edit. So we are again going back to sort of, you know, cultural studies concerns in terms of, you know, class and privilege, you know, who has the leisure, if you go back to, you know, Lagan, why are the villagers making fun of Car Captain Russell and his team playing cricket? Because the villagers don't have the leisure as adult men who are working on their farms and who don't know if they would be able to provide for their families the next day. They absolutely do not have the leisure to play a sport, right? 
So again, you know, differentiated histories and differentiated cultural context, and that is what you know cultural studies is interested in. And what makes cultural studies such an you know amazing field is it's constantly responding to the needs of the time. So you mentioned, you know, or sort of, you know, asked, you know, what's happening now? What is it responding to? So again, as I said, it is responding to, say, for instance, in the in the U.S. context, what's happening in terms of police violence. In the U.K. context, or you know, more largely, it's asking questions like, why is it that with the coronavirus, so many more Black um, people are dying compared to other populations in sort of the U.S. or the U.K. Right. So why is it that those who are more vulnerable are further affected by coronavirus? If you think of, you know, the Indian context and, and the work or sort of the media coverage that we have seen in terms of migrant laborers. So who has the privilege to be home safe and don't have to worry about the income or providing food for their families who have to be out on the street if you're a street vendor, you know, if you're selling groceries and your income is dependent on you being out on the street, do you have the privilege to stay home? So cultural studies is now sort of you know, responding to this particular context of you know, privilege, of you know, being able to physically distance yourself from a possibly infected person. Or why does you know, these crisis moments make certain vulnerable populations more vulnerable? So it could be based on class or race or housing, right? If you are sharing you know, a one room flat with five other people and you need to go out to work, can you really physically distance yourself? So again, questions of unemployment, housing, questions of you know, space, those are all of the questions uh, you know, that um, cultural studies as a field is now responding to in relation to what's you know emerging right now. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much for you know for the deliberations. And uh, in fact, there are many more questions, but uh, I know we are uh, already running late. And uh, thank you very much for sparing your valuable time with us. And uh, we know that you have you know uh, health issues to with that again you've spent your time with us for sharing your expertise on the subject thank you very much in fact uh, we've got a lot of uh, positive feedback coming uh, many uh, saying thank you to you for the informative engaging uh, enriching session on cultural studies and they're immensely thankful to you for uh, having you know uh, introduced the subject with a lot of clarity and ease and uh, Many are, in fact, uh, wanting to go back to watch Lagan again after listening to your deliberation. So they're extremely happy, and the response is very, very positive. Uh, thank you very much on behalf of uh, the Department of English. Uh, we are extremely thankful to you for having uh, spared your valuable time with us. And uh, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank all those who have spent their morning with us. Uh, we had uh, close to 240 participants listening to your talk. So uh, I also thank all those who actually spared their time and were with us in our venture. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Dr. Chandrima Chakravarti. And ma'am, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, just a word. Uh, uh, there is a feedback form which will be given to you in the chat box. Uh, you can uh, submit that. I was also looking at all the feedback. Uh, we have very uh, good feedback. So thank you for all of that. And uh, thank you, Dr. Chandrima Chakravarti, for your time and for accepting our invitation and on behalf of the principal and the IQC coordinator to the team and especially the Department of English students and uh, uh, the teachers, my colleagues, I would like to extend uh, thank you. And there are a lot of comments there. And as promised, maybe we could have another lecture on visual uh, <laughs> studies, but not now. I'm sure you would want your rest and we too. So it was nice and thank you so much. I would like to thank all the participants who are watching live, uh, who were with us, all the registered participants for taking your valuable time. We appreciate that fact that uh, you took your time to come and listen to us. And I'm sure the students of Kerala University and all the others are greatly benefited from this when you're about to write your exams. That was the initial idea for this whole uh, lecture, uh, for this webinar. So thank you again so much for all, all that uh, uh, we've heard so, so, so far. And thank you for you sparing your time. And goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you yeah. for listening and for this opportunity. I hope it was helpful. Thank you. Thank you. The feedback is it available um, can can you just check on that all can uh, submit the feedback forms yes no, i don't i don't think the feedback 
is given yet. And I'm going to leave. Is that okay? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It will be given to the registered participants and to anyone. We please leave your feedback. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. The link, I think, is not given, ma'am. It will be given. Yeah. It will be given. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. So, uh, I think we can also leave. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.